And now it's time for this year's Honorary Doctor of Fine Arts. This is an honor bestowed each year on a person who has, through their work and life, made profound transformations through, through art, for art, and through society, and for society. What Gehindi Wiley has done through, throughout his career is to make paintings that make the invisible visible, that transform how we think about power, and look and what it looks like and what it should look like. The story Kahindi tells with his extraordinary portrait of Barack Obama is one of those stories of the conversion of power, the accessibility of power, and that it is part of what we are and who we are, and it's not bestowed on us. It is our right. Imagine a long haul of portraits of presidents imperially arranged, and then suddenly we come to this vibrant green, vibrant nature image. Here is a man sitting relaxed, weary for knowing what he knows, but looking us in the eyes, approachable. You can imagine him asking us, what is it? What do you need to know? The humanness of that president, the connectedness displayed there, that is the disruption of this most important painting of the 21st century. This is the change point that a piece of art can make it confirms our humanity and our connectedness to humanity. Kahindi is applying the gift that this school strives to give all of you, a way of thinking that allows for transformative freshness alongside ancient truth. This really is the core of SFAI's work, to empower the next generation of creative, engaged life changers. Key to how that happens is what happens in the studio what happens between the professors and the students, and through the crits and other conversations. So I'm really pleased to announce and to announce to you and introduce to you someone who worked closely with Kahindi as a young artist and can speak directly to that process, to that alchemy of what happens in the studio. I'd like to introduce Associate Professor of Painting, Dewey Crumpler. Well, um, I appreciate <laughs> that. I appreciate that. Uh, it, it's truly a pleasure and really an honor to share the stage with a colleague of mine, Mildred Howard, a great artist, a magnificent maker. And then uh, Kahinde Wiley, who I must say uh, is really quite extraordinary. Um, I want to begin, though, like everyone, thanking the mothers who made this possible. And I want to thank them deeply. But I want to begin talking about my experience with Kahinde by thanking his mother, because it was his mother who took him, willing or not, to museums. She exposed him to music. She prepared him for the extraordinary life he was going to lead. She showed him what power looks like. He was able to grow up in those environments where greatness lived, on the ground and in museums. And so she helped to prepare him for when he got to the Art Institute. He was ready. 
He was hungry. He was in desire of the ability to become what he had grown up inspired by. And that is a maker of supreme ability. Engaged in something that doesn't do anything. It, sit, it simply sits there on a wall and projects you, not it. So the painting is a window into you. And he wanted that power. And he came to the Art Institute to get it. And I remember distinctly watching him move, as I do many students who are young, and trying to find out who they are. First, nervous, unable, really, to sort of make their way in this new environment. But over time, engaged with these extraordinary professors, they begin to shift. Their skills develop. That confidence I could see in Kahinde as he rolled ac across the quad. And I could see that this young man was really quite interesting and was on to something that would really be interesting for him to develop. And so he then, toward the end of his time at the Art Institute, took a course, a couple of courses from me. And I saw his skill, his ability, the confidence that was emerging in his work. And I saw also that he was making images, which absolutely, at the time that he was making them, at the time like my own, he was going to be asked a question about his investigation that is a proverbial question is a question that I had been asked numerous times by professors, is that do you want to be known as an artist or a black artist? And I asked that question to Kahinde because I knew it was a question he would get throughout his creative life. And Kahinde looked at me like I was crazy. And I thought, okay, he's clear. He's clear. That is, he, he, this is not even a question to him. He is going to make him. And so whatever him turns out to be, that is what he's going to make. And he was clear about it. And for me, that was all I needed. Now, then, then, Kahende, Kahende told me, as he was getting ready to graduate. I'm going to Africa. And I thought, man, this boy here, he is no joke. He said, I'm going to Africa in search of my father. And when he came back, he took me up into room eight. And he turned on a film. And that film was of his searching for his father. The film was extraordinary. I knew this young man is not only capable of painting pictures that he is interested in, but he also has the skill to be an absolute filmmaker of real quality. And that is really wonderful. And then he left to go to Yale. <laughs> and I knew that he was ready for Yale. Would Yale be ready for him? In fact, in fact, in fact, in fact, he inhaled Yale. And in, and in that way, he was prepared to go to Harlem, where he got with two extraordinary women that nurtured him. And I say that in the sense that they made a platform for him. 
They made a platform that provided him with the kind of freedom and time and insight to live in a community that was historic. And he walked into those streets and he observed that, that extraordinary lean, which is a particular way that many of the inhabitants of Harlem articulate space. And he looked at that lean and thought of it as a particular kind of construction, a construction that was born in history, a construction that was designed to ward off the historical dimensions that produce that necessity to create that lean. And in that context, he found his future. That is, he found that extraordinary sound that was in the street, that hip hop beat, that lean of musical dimension that expressed an age. And he took it, filtered it through his experiences as a TA for Robert Ferris Thompson, one of the greatest Africanists in the world with his blonde hair. And he shaped a kind of understanding about Africa and about Africanness that Kahinde absorbed while his TA, and then came to Harlem and refashioned. He took that lean and disturbed it. That, that hus that many males produce in order to take a certain stance, and he softened it. He restructured it in the 20th century so that it would be ready for the 21st century, the complications of the 21st century. And as a result, he became a superstar, a star of immense talent and immense power. He injected into the artistic dialogue that which disturbed that question that I articulated earlier in all of its dimensions. He then was noticed by the President of the United States, a historical event, two African Americans, one an immense weight of history. All those centuries culminating in the body of a sophisticated, and I will say hip, president. <laughs> and in that context, he had the insight and the knowledge that they were both seekers of their father in Africa, no matter what this orange hair says. He was born in America, but his father was from Africa. And that symbiosis of experience really developed a kind of symbiotic symbiosis that these two individuals communicated and turned into that way of making the president not as a vertical image of power, not sitting or standing at a desk, but really sitting like a king. And I don't mean a king that governs over the earth. I mean a king of his possession, his power, but subtle power, not aggressive po power. His hands articulated so that they are the crossroads, an indication to the country, do you go this way or do you go that way? Set in a field of regeneration, that is to say, those leaves which come and go, those flowers 
that represent the world. And that engagement gives us a new way to look at power, a new way to look at the history of portraiture. For if Kahende had never been given the opportunity to paint the president, he would already be a historical figure. That is, you can't write the history of the 21st century without Kahende's work. It's not possible. Therefore, in the same way, you now cannot write American history without a relationship to that person sitting in that chair. And as a result, you could not write the history of the Art Institute. Because like those giants who helped to shape the Art Institute, Kahinde Wiley's name is now a permanent part of the shape-shifting that this institution represents. And just as he sit in those, sat in those chairs, years ago, not knowing whether he would be sitting in this one. That possibility exists for you. And finally, I want to say something personal. Because as a child, as a child at night, when I had to go to bed, I had strict parents. And they made me go into that room and I would take that art history book and I would take a flashlight and I would study those images of Caravaggio, of Leonardo, of all the great artists of Western history in search of myself, which of course I couldn't see. And when I went to college, I couldn't see because they refused to teach anything other than the Western canon. But now I'm overjoyed that no child, no matter where they are in the world, will be able to go to bed with that flickering blue light as they Google images for art, <laughs> that they won't wind up seeing Mildred and Kahinde Wiley. And for that, I say, Kahinde Wiley. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Dewey Crumpler. Mildred Howard. And the class, my God, you guys are in for it. You're right. It's not easy out there. And there's nothing given, and there's a lot taken. Mother's Day is, of course, here. And a lot of you have said, um, what's up to Mama? So what's up, Mama? <laughs> I am uh, incredibly grateful this, for this opportunity. You can't imagine how amazing it feels to have been once like Dewey said, sitting in one of those seats and right up here talking to you guys. It's out of body. It's uh, out of form. It's out of, you know, the normal tempo of life. Like I spend every day basically in the studio kind of dealing with a hairy stick and colored paste and, you know, <laughs> zhuzhing things into existence. Um, this is out there. However, it, it's not entirely out there because I sort of, designed it to be outsized. I designed it to be bigger than what I thought I could even handle. When you think that life is not gonna give you much, you sort of like design for superstructure so that you can sort of like maybe meet in the middle. Uh, somehow it sort of met at the top. What uh, I try to do with my work here uh, and the work that I've been doing for the last 20 odd years is to celebrate people who happen to look like me. Uh, I go into small communities. I go into small villages in Africa, uh, go into underserved communities in New York, go into places where people are oftentimes marginalized and invisible. And I simply turn on the camera, turn on the lights, 
get the generators going, and ask them how they want to be seen. Let them have control over how their painting is going to be made. People don't write about that often, but it's their choice. It's, it's, not, it's not mine. I'm at service of people's will. I'm at, at service of uh, an urge to be visible. I think as, as artists, we know that quite intimately, that, that urge for people to see what it is that makes us unique in the world, to sort of scratch an itch that's nascent in all of us. Well, so I allow people to scratch that itch. And it doesn't always look what you, like what you think it's going to look like. It looks oftentimes counter-masculine. Sometimes it looks uh, heroic. Sometimes there's wieldings of swords and there's horses. And sometimes it looks absolutely pathetic. But in the end, it's what those people want. Is there a those people is the question. Is that difference between me and the other? Empathy is such a big part of what art making is about. We as creators, you as young people, are going to be caught up in an empire of, of aesthetic arms war. Basically, we're all trying to figure out how to make the next best move towards making something that matters in the world at its best. The careerist in you will just simply try to get rich. I, I would argue that the better part of what you're about is to engage in that arms war, engage in that sense of how closer can I get to this question of empathy? How close can I get to this question of who is that person sitting next to me, that person that makes me feel slightly uncanny, slightly unfamiliar? My work at its best is trying to stab at the creases there trying to sort of pull back the skin of familiarity and allowing for people who don't necessarily look or abide within the same narratives to occupy the same space and breathe the same air. We as creative people have the desire to be loved. And me, of course, I'm I like in that. I'm like, like when I first got like a horrible review, it was, uh, it was devastating. But in the end, it also created um, a sense in which tough skin is mandatory. You have to walk through the world with a certain swagger, like, I don't give a mm. <laughs> And it comes with time. It's easier said than done, right? There's, there's a sense of grace that comes after knowing when you're at your best. There's a peak performance that happens as artists, as creators. And I have this conversation with uh, God, another San Francisco alum, uh, Iona Brown, who also followed uh, and went on to the uh, City Museum. She and I were having these conversations about, like, where are you at your best? Where's, where's that moment where you feel as though you really hit your stride? And she said it, it happens when there's no difference between herself, her physical female body, and the body outside. There's no sense of race or class or structure. She's simply operating, as she said, like, like the white boys do, right? These questions of like autonomy, power, the sense of freedom, the, the, the way in which someone can say, this is my America, that, that's, that swag, that state of grace, that's what you want to get to. That's that itch that you want to scratch. That's what we're all trying to get to. And I think that's what the San Francisco Arts Institute prepared me for in a way that wasn't like, something written down in books. Sure, I mean, there was methodology of modernism, there was amazing class of Dewey. Dewey's sense of like personal uh, invention uh, was something that, that I can't forget. But the real lesson, I think, came from the kids that I was with. Just, you know, my friends. What are you doing? That sucks. Like, do you really think that you're something? There was that sense of like the heroic in myself. Like I really wanted to, to, to become something, but I didn't know who I was. I was broke. I was trying to find a job. I was, I was actually, uh, well, the highest paying job on campus was the, the figure model. So I was a nude model for uh, drawing classes and all my friends were making these paintings. There was a sense in which we let go of all boundaries 
all things that separated, like literally standing there. Um, so to behold the difference between the self and the other is your jobs, class. Can't believe I'm up here. <laughs> it's true. I mean, that's all we have. That's all we have. Like, look at your toolkit. Who, who's ever best at breaking down that skin is going to be at the closest connection to themselves. And then everything else will follow. This is it. Get ready. Showtime. <laughs> Cheers. I'm not going to embarrass you by trying to put it on, <laughs> just in case it don't fit. Good deal. Good deal. But anyway, it's that's nice. beautiful. That's awesome. All right. Cool. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Guys. Yay! Yay!